Hi, my name's Paul Grogan. Welcome to the first in a series of videos where I'm going to be teaching you how to play Crescent Moon. Crescent Moon is an asymmetric game for four or five players, and I've split this into two videos. The first video, this one, is where I'm going to be teaching four friends how to play the game. It's a full teach. It is about an hour long, which is a long time for a how to play video, but this is an asymmetric game. So as well as covering the basic rules of how the game plays, we also cover all of the special abilities and the scoring conditions for each of the five characters. As I mentioned, this is a four or five player game. And the rules that I'm going to teach you in this video is for the five player game. And then the second video is the playthrough video. So if you already know how to play the game and you just want to see us playing it, you can click on the little eye in the corner or the link in the description of the video and that will take you to the five player playthrough. Or you can watch that playthrough video after this one once you know how to play the game. A big thank you to Osprey Games for commissioning this video and if you like the content that I create please consider supporting me at patreon.com forward slash gaming rules as I do rely on the financial support of my Patreon campaign in order to help fund the channel and keep making more videos like this. Okay, so without further ado, let's get to the table and teach you how to play. Crescent Moon takes place amidst the dramatic rise and fall of powers across the Middle East in the 10th century and onwards. It's a game for four or five players, and although a lot of the rules are common to all players, each player has special rules and scoring conditions that only apply to them. The ravaging forces of the Warlord, over there, uh, you're going to be sweeping across the land, chasing after promises of plunder. The secretive Murshid, the pink player, uh, works to covertly undermine the central authorities through an expansive network of agents. Sounds just like Rob. Um, <laughs> Peter is playing the ambitious Sultan, sitting in his golden palace, presiding over great works of architecture. I'm going to be playing the Caliph, and I'm aiming to preserve order through military might. Emily is playing the Nomad, and you're trying to sow discord in order to secure employment for your experienced mercenaries. The game is played over three rounds, with each round representing one year of time. There is a variant rule where you can play four years if you want to. We're just going to be playing the normal game today. We're going to be playing three years. Uh, and each year is divided into three phases. The preparation phase, the action phase, and the scoring phase. Preparation phase is where you collect income, uh, do reserves and upkeep. The action phase is the bulk of the game. That's where each player, in turn order, starting with the Warlord and going clockwise, will take one action. Then we'll all take another action, then another action, then another action. That's the end of the action phase. Then we do the scoring phase. In the scoring phase, you will gain victory points based on your character-specific objectives, which we'll go into later on. So just to clarify, three years in the game, and in each year, you will get to do four turns. That means you will take 12 turns in the entire game, which isn't very much. So you've got to make every turn count. Yeah. So before we dive into the rules, let's talk about what we have on the board and some important terminology. This board setup is the recommended setup for your first game with five players. The back of the rulebook does list the setup if you were playing with four players, and there are variant other maps that you can play with as well. Each hex is a specific type of terrain. The green terrain is fertile land. That will generate you income. Quarries will generate you more income, but they're harder to build in. Mountains and deserts won't generate you any income, but they are also harder to build in. Uh, the holy site is actually a desert hex, but it is a special type of desert hex because all players have a, one of their objectives is to control that hex. So we're all fighting over that particular place. There is another type of hex as well, which is the wilderness, which I think I might have referred to as the wasteland during the video, but it should be the wilderness. The wilderness type of hex doesn't cost any extra to build on, but it does not generate any income. Any two hexes that share an edge are considered adjacent, However, adjacency is broken by rivers. So this hex, for example, is not adjacent to this one, even though they share a hex because there's a river there. The river crossing in the middle of the board is special. It is adjacent to every hex that it shares a side with, unless the other hex has a river on that side. So the river crossing here is adjacent to here. It's also adjacent to here. It's also adjacent to here, here and here. It's not adjacent to here because that river is actually blocking it from that way, okay? So the river crossing, the fact that there's a river on it is purely cosmetic. You could remove that river and the rules would be the same, okay? So it's basically, it's not really a river for the purposes of, of adjacency. We already have various types of pieces on the board, so let's go over them now and we'll cover a few important game terms. The first game term to talk about is presence. 
you have presence in a hex as long as you have any of your pieces there, which is basically anything in your colour. The small exception to that are these yellow green buildings. These are green. These are owned by the Sultan. So the Sultan is going to be building towns and cities all over the map. They are, they are the Sultan's pieces. So the Sultan is going to get presence in a lot of different places across the map. It is possible and highly likely that multiple players can have presence in a hex. It doesn't start off like that, but it, it will be like that fairly soon. The next term to cover is control. You have control over a hex if you have any pieces there that have combat strength. Pieces that have combat strength are the discs, which are units. They are ordinary units or mercenary units. Mercenary units if they've got the camel on, ordinary units if they don't have the camel on, but they have a combat strength. Uh, forts, which are these, and castles, which are these. All of those three things have combat strength and you need them in order to control the hex. So there's a, there's a big difference between presence and control. Only one player can have control of a hex at any time, and if a player moves pieces which have a combat strength into a hex that another player has control over, there is a combat. So at the start of the game, the Warlord, for example, has control of this hex here because you have a unit there which has a combat strength of one. But you do not have control of this hex. Even though you've got influence there, you don't control that hex. The Murshid starts off with control here because of the fort, but you do not have control here because it's just influence. The Sultan has control here, but not here because towns and cities do not have combat strength. Okay, so yeah, understanding the, the term control is important. The final term to talk about is influence. This is really easy. You have influence in a hex if you have an influence token on the hex. And that's it, it doesn't matter. Control and presence and influence are three completely separate things. Only one player can have influence in a hex at any time. So speaking of the pieces, you will notice that each player has a different amount of each of the types of pieces. Okay, so the Warlord, for example, has a huge number of units. The Murshid, not, not so many units, but we have a different amount of each of the units. And the discs, as I mentioned, if it's a blank side, it represents ordinary units. If it's a camel side, it represents mercenary units. For the purposes of the way that they work in the game, there's some slight differences. The Warlord and the Caliph are the only players that can have ordinary units. All of us can have mercenary units, but we are the only ones that can have ordinary units. So the Sultan doesn't have any forces of his own, the Murshid doesn't have any forces of their own, and the Nomad is all about mercenaries. Okay, so you two can only get your units by hiring the mercenaries, and we, we can hire mercenaries from the mm -hmm. Nomad as well, but we've also got our own units. Um, each player also has a number of forts, castles, and influence pieces, and the Sultan also has the settlements, as I've mentioned, towns and cities. The Caliph has a palace. I'm the only player who has a palace. The palace is very, very special. It counts as a settlement and as a stronghold. So it, it has combat strength, but it also counts as a settlement. That's going to go on the board before the start of the game. We'll do that in a second. Right, players also start with a varying amount of money. The Warlord and the Murshid start with three coins. The Sultan starts with 16 coins. Wow. I start with eight coins as the Caliph, and the Nomad starts with nothing. Sad times. You did have some money, but the Sultan stole it. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, each player also begins the game with five victory points. Now, victory points are supposed to be kept secret. So we all get five, and that is because there is a way that you can lose points in the game. Um, and it's the player with the most points at the end of the game who is the winner. Just before the game starts, two things happen. First of all, the Caliph player chooses one of the hexes that they control and decides which one they want to place their palace in. So I'm going to put it here. Okay. The next thing that happens is the Murshid takes a plot action. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain the rest of the rules first, and then, just before we start the game, you get to do a plot action, and then the game starts. Okay, any questions so far? So does the Callus Palace go on as well as the castle? Yes. Yes, it doesn't replace the castle. Gotcha. Yeah. So, so there's a strength four combat four? unit in that mountain now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure whether to put it there, actually. I might put it there. I put it there in the first time. I play. I've played the Caliph twice before, and I've come last... Uh, uh, or second to last <laughs> every game I've played I can put it there no it's got to be in a hex that I control you control um, yeah 
So I no, I think I, yeah, I'll, I'll put it here again. We'll put we'll put it here. And we're we're lining them down for the purposes of the overhead camera. Normally, you would have them standing up, but yeah, we're lining them down for the overhead camera. So, the first phase of the game is the preparation phase, and the first part of the preparation phase is income. For income, you look at each hex that you control. Income is summarised on the back of your player aid. Okay, so if you look at your player aid, income is summarised at the top. I will go through it now. You are going to gain money, as I say, for each hex that you control. Uh, one hex if it's fertile land, three if it's a quarry, one if there's a town there, two if there's a city there, and one if the Sultan has influence in the hex. So that's the same for all of us, including the Sultan. So if the Sultan has influence in a hex, or has a town or a city in the hex, and you control it, it's good for you as well. You're going to generate money. Now, the Sultan, being the Sultan, gets special bonus income as well. The Sultan, in addition to their normal income, gets one coin per town, two coins per city, and one coin per influence. So, for example, in the first year, the Warlord controls this hex, but it's a wasteland, and there's no settlement there, so you don't get any income. So your income in the first round of the game is, is zero. The Murshid only controls this hex. It is fertile land, so that's worth one. And that's it. So your income in the first round will be one. The Sultan, we'll come back to the Sultan in a minute. <laughs> the Caliph controls these two hexes. One of them is the Wasteland. No, it's not. It's Mountains, which earns no income. But the River Crossing is fertile land, so gets one income. The Nomad controls this hex, but it's Wasteland, and so gets no income. The Palace is also a settlement. The Palace is a settlement, but it isn't a town or a city. Okay. It's so it doesn't, a town. So it doesn't correct. Matter, yes. Yeah. yeah. Good question, though. Um, so the Sultan controls this hex because he's got two military units there. Uh, it's fertile land, which is one. It's got a town in it, which is another one. But you don't get any money for this hex because although the Sultan has a, t a city there, doesn't actually control it. Okay. So the Sultan's income for the hexes it controls is two. But then the Sultan gets one for every town, two for every city. So the Sultan's income in the first year of the game wow. is five. And that's going to go up. <laughs> it's going to go up a lot as the game goes on. Right. Um, the next step is reserves. Now, this only applies to the Warlord, the Caliph, and the Nomad. We all have a reserve card. Okay? So if you want to pop your reserve card just so it's on camera, Paul. Um, no, no, just in front of you. Yeah, just in front of you. We need to see that during the game. So first thing you do in the reserves step is you calculate your reserve value. For the, for the Warlord, that's easy. Your reserve value is always three. The Caliph's reserve value is equal to the number of castles and influence tokens that I have on the board. So it starts off at two. It can go up as the game goes on. It might go down. The Nomad, yours is three, multiplied by the number of influence tokens that you have on the board. You currently have two influence tokens on the board, so your reserve value is six. Mm -hmm. But that will go up during the game. So once you've calculated your... Um, reserve value, you then calculate your current strength. For the Warlord and the Caliph, our current strength is equal to the total number of ordinary units, not mercenaries, just ordinary units, that we have both combined on the map and on our reserve card. So right now your strength is one, one. and mine is one. Okay. The Nomad's current strength is equal to the total number of mercenary units on the map of all players. So the way to think about the mercenary units, this is a mercenary unit. It's actually a nomad mercenary unit that is currently working for you. Okay, but it's still counted. It's a sultan's unit, but thematically, it, it's, it's been gained from the nomads. Then what you do is if your reserve value is higher than your strength, you add discs to the card to make up the difference. So at the start of the game, your reserve value is three, your strength is one. You're going to add two discs to the card. My reserve value is two. My strength is one. I'm going to add one disc to the card. Your reserve value is six. There is currently two, two mercenary units on the board. That's so cool. you're going to add four counters to it. So that's what happens in the reserve step. And that's just for us three. Right. Next step is upkeep. This is not done in year one. But I will explain it now just so that you know what happens. During the game, you're going to be collecting and playing these power cards. 
Some of these cards, when played, will stay face up on the table in front of you. So characters and battalions, when you play them, they do what they say and they remain face up in front of you. In the upkeep step, they come back to your hand. Basically, those cards are playable once per round. You play them whenever you need to play them, they stay face up, and in the next upkeep phase, you'll get them back. Characters are identified by a person in the top right. Uh, battalions are a flag. So that, that's two of the types of cards. While we're talking about them, the lightning bolt is an event card. When you play that, it does what it says and is then discarded. We'll come on to your warfare card in a minute, because that's, mm -hmm. that's special. The final thing you do in the upkeep phase is the two cards in the near market will disappear. Everything will slide down and we'll get two more. The Sultan's Market does not refresh in the upkeep phase. So that's a thing to remember. It will not refresh as normal. Any questions about the preparation phase? Okay, right. The action phase is the main part of the game. So starting with the Warlord and then proceeding clockwise, we will each perform one action. Once we've done that, we'll go around again, all do a second action and so on and so forth. We do that until we've all taken four actions. The full list of actions you can perform is printed on your player aid. Now, these player aids are all unique. We don't all have the same. So there are certain actions which we can all do, but might be slightly different. Uh, and there are some actions which are player specific. What I'm going to do first is I'm going to talk about the actions which we can all do, and then we'll go on to the player specific ones. So the first action is influence. All players can do this. What you do is you choose a hex on the board where you have presence or that is adjacent to a hex where you have presence and you put one of your influence tokens there. There you go. Nice and simple. Sort of. If another player already had presence there, then there will be an influence contest. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted to gain influence there, I could because there's nobody there. If I wanted to gain influence here, or here, or here, or here, I might not be able to, because somebody else is somebody else is there. They might be able to, in, you know, change change the the output of that. Um, but that's how the influence action works. Now it would be relatively simple if it weren't for the sneaky Murshid player. So the Murshid player, if you want to place an influence token in a hex adjacent to where the Murshid has an influence token. That starts a contest as well. So for the Warlord, you cannot just claim influence here at the start of the game. Even though it's empty, there's nobody there, the Murshid has present, uh, the Murshid has influence on an adjacent hex. So therefore, if you try and place influence here, the Murshid might have something to say about it. Okay? Could I could I try and then you can have try. An influence we'll, contest we'll, with yeah, the Murshid? We'll talk about the influence contest mm -hmm. later on. You can try, okay. I'm not saying it won't work. Right. But it would be down to playing of cards and things like that. Right. Okay. Any questions about the influence action? Right. Some of the characters want to place influence more than others. So I can't I can't remember, but I think I think the Caliph doesn't really bother much with influence. I don't think the Warlord bothers much with influence. Um, but I think the other players do. The Murshid's all about it. It's all about it. We can tell the Warlord only has four cap four influence tokens. There we go. You can probably work out they're yeah. not overly in yeah. You know, Right, the next action, action is the build action. Everybody can do this except for the Warlord. The Warlord does not know how to build things. The Murshid, the Caliph and the Nomad, we all have a build two action. The Sultan has a build three action. So when you perform this action, you build the indicated number of strongholds and settlements in any combination, but you are limited to building one per hex. So for example, even though you've got three builds, you cannot build a town somewhere and then immediately upgrade it to a city, okay? Your player thing tells you the cost of building, uh, the location where you can build. And if you're building in a mountain or quarry, it costs extra, building in a desert costs extra. But basically, um, we could all build forts and castles. The Sultan can also build settlements, but it says on here where you can build, which is generally, we can only build forts and castles well, we can build fort where you've got presence. It can't be controlled by another player, and it doesn't already contain a fort or a castle. And then on a future turn, you can upgrade the fort into a castle. Okay. Whereas the Sultan, from what I remember, you can build towns and cities anywhere on the board. 
I don't think there's any restriction as long as there isn't already a town or a city. Any hex without a town or a city. Yeah. And then, of course, once I've built that, you've then got presents. I've then got presents. Exactly. Okay. Um, so, yes, the rules for building strongholds is the same for all players. My strongholds are slightly cheaper. Okay. It's just a little bonus that I've got. Forts can be built. Uh, I've mentioned that anyway, where you have presents. Castles can be built where you've already got a fort. Uh, forts and castles are counted as strongholds. They have combat strength and therefore they can be used to control hexes. Um, only the Sultan can build towns and cities. Towns can be built on any hex anywhere as, as long as there isn't already a town or a city there. And cities can be built on a hex where there's already a town and you upgrade the town into a city. Remember, towns and cities are good for both the Sultan and the player who controls the hex because they're going to generate income. Any questions about the build action? The next action to explain is the move action. All players can do this. Everybody except the Warlord has a move two action. The Warlord has a move three action. So when with each move, you can move any number of your units from one hex to an adjacent hex. But you cannot move into a hex controlled by another player. So with the move action, you cannot start a combat. You are purely just moving your units around. And the same unit or units may move multiple times. So let's say, for example, I had three units here and I did a move two, I could move and then move again, right? Or I could move and then move. So every time you move, it is any number of units from one hex to an adjacent hex. There is a stacking limit. All players have a stacking limit of five units per hex, except for the Warlord, who has a stacking limit of seven. Any questions about the move action? So if you want to start a combat, you can't use the move action. You have to choose the assault action. All players can do this, and it's the same for everybody. It's similar to the move action, um, but you only get to move uh, one group of units from one hex to an adjacent hex. It starts a combat, which I'll explain later on, but you can also use this action to move into a hex that another player doesn't control, but contains a settlement. So for example, if you had a unit here and you wanted to go into there to sack this, that would be an assault. You would move in there and you would destroy that and you'd gain loads of money from it. So that's the assault action as well, even though nobody currently controls that hex. So yeah, remember that settlements don't have any combat strength, so they don't control the hex on their own. So you could move in there and then it would kind of, it wouldn't be your settlement, but you know, you'd get money from it, you'd get income from it. But if you wanted to move in there and sack it, you'd have to use the assault action. That's fine. Any yeah. questions about the assault action? Right. So let's talk about now how you get new units into the game. And this is different for some players. First of all, the recruit action. Only the warlord, the caliph and the nomad can do this because you are taking uh, units from your reserve card into the board. The Warlord and the Nomad have Recruit 2, the Caliph has Recruit 3. And when you recruit, you simply take that number of units from your reserve card and place them on the board into one or more hexes. The Warlord and the Caliph can only place units where they already have presence. And we place ordinary units because it's ordinary units that will be on there. The Nomad, however, can place units on any hex not controlled by another player. So literally, they just pop them out of the sand. Mm. that's the recruit action any questions about that one right the other way to get units into the game is to bribe or hire mercenaries and this is different depending on the number of players in the game we're playing a five player game today so you can um, bribe and hire mercenaries if we were playing a four player game the bribe mercenaries action is not available and the hire mercenaries is slightly different but I'll explain how it works for a five player game. So the first action to explain is bribing mercenaries. Everybody can do this except for the Nomad. The Nomad cannot bribe their own mercenaries. Um, so before you perform the bribe mercenaries action, you choose a hex on the board, which contains at least one Nomad mercenary unit. For example, here. What you do is you make a deal with Emily, who is the Nomad player, about how much you want to pay for that unit. It could be zero. I don't know why you'd ever accept it as zero, but it is a legal offer. Um, if you can't make an agreement, you can say, I'll do a different action instead. So you declare you're doing the action. You then offer Emily a certain amount of money. Money. 
money, yeah. If Emily doesn't agree to it, then you say, okay, I'll do a different action instead. But if Emily does agree to it, then what happens is those units, and it can be one or two units, if there was more than two, you can still do it, but you only ever get to bribe one or two at a time. What happens is you pay the nomad the agreed amount of money, you remove the mercenary units from the hex and replace them with mercenary units of your own. Now, if Emily had three in there and you bought two of them, then there's a combat straight away because you've now got pieces from two different factions or two different players in, in the same hex. For your convenience, I'll make sure that doesn't happen. Okay. For a price. <laughs> Assuming there wasn't a combat, you get to do a move one or an assault action with the mercenaries that you've just bribed. Right. That is bribing mercenaries. Okay, hiring mercenaries, and I'm going to explain how this works in a five-player game. Before taking the action, you make an agreement with the Nomad player on the price for one or two mercenaries from the reserve card. If you can't agree, you can choose a different action. If you can agree, you pay the Nomad the agreed amount of money. Uh, the Nomad removes those mercenary units from the card back to the supply and you take the same number of mercenary units from your supply and puts them into hexes where you have presence and nobody else has control. Okay, in a four player game, the Nomad isn't in a four player game. So in a four player game, the Nomad doesn't play. You don't choose four of the characters. It's us four, not the Nomad. Hmm. If you were playing a four player game, you would simply pay two coins to the bank for one unit and six coins for two units. Now, I don't know if that gives you an idea of the value of those mercenaries. Highly valuable, because as I hear, they're, they're really well trained as well. <laughs> so very limited supply. Yes. Okay, right. Next action to explain is buying power cards. These are an important part of the game. All players can do this action. Before you take the action, you can offer the Sultan a certain amount of money for one of these cards. If you cannot agree on a price, you can carry on and do the action anyway. Or you can say, I'll do a different action. So unlike bribing or hiring mercenaries, if you can't make an agreement with Emily, you might as well do another action because you've no choice otherwise. Mm. But when you uh, buy power cards, you can buy one card from the near market, one card from the middle market, one card from the far market, and one card from the Sultan's market. So for example, if I choose to buy power cards, I can say to Peter, I'll buy this one for one. If he says no, I can still go ahead with the action and buy one from there, one from there, and one from there. I just can't buy the one that I agreed. But if he says yes, I can buy that one as well. Cards bought from the near market cost two, middle market costs four, far market costs six. Cards from the Sultan market cost however much you've agreed. If the Sultan takes the buy power card action, you can take one of these cards for free. Feel free to give you yourself your money if you want to, but you know, it, it's free. Now, here's the interesting thing. Cards come in different colours. The colours correspond to the player, and there isn't an equal mix of cards in the deck. Most of the cards in the deck are Murshid cards. Some of them are Warlord cards, some of them Nomad cards, some of them are Caliph cards. There are no Sultan cards in the deck at all, so you won't find any green cards in the deck. When you buy a card from the market, you pay the, pl the player who is aligned to that card. The money goes to them. And this is where the Murshid is going to make a lot of your money from because we're going to be buying a lot of your cards from here. If you buy your own card, you pay half the price to the bank. Cards that you buy go into your hand. They can be kept secret. The number of cards you have is public knowledge, but you can keep them secret. Now, bear in mind, we all see what card you've bought. So there is a little bit of player memory. Well, well, sorry to yep. you, but one point there is that the people watching won't be able to see uh, the text on any of the cards. No, no, that's true. But one thing I will mention is the ship's card. So the ship's card is an anytime card. Anytime means it doesn't cost an action to play. You can literally play it pretty much any time. And it means for the action that you're about to do, rivers don't block adjacency. So just be aware that there are cards in the game called ships, which allow you to cross jump, the rivers. Jump and, the rivers. And, and the others just generally tend to just add to combat yeah. or influence contests. That's yes. what most of them seem to do. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, you can have a maximum of eight cards in hand. And after you've bought all of your cards, we shuffle the cards down, we replenish the market. We do not replenish the Sultan's market, even if you buy cards from there. Okay, the next action to explain is 
playing a power card. Now, this only applies to the power cards that specifically say the word action, of which there are currently one in play, right? It's there. So the playing the power card action is only if it says action. If it doesn't say action, then they are played either during combat or during influence or, in the case of that one, at any time, okay? Um, the cards are self fa fairly self-explanatory. I'll explain how the combat and the influence ones work when we cover those contests. And as I mentioned, cards with a lightning bolt are event cards. You play them, you do what it says, and then they get discarded. Uh, we've mentioned characters and battalions. What we haven't mentioned is the Warlords card. Do you want to just put your, yep. your Warfare card? So the Warlord starts the game with one card in hand, which is a Warfare card. It's a strategy card. It's the only one in the game. And basically, every time the Warlord is in combat, you can play that card, and it comes back to your hand at the end of the combat. So if you have multiple combats in a year, it's there, it's there all of the time. Any questions about playing a power card? Okay, let's talk about the special actions which are unique to the players, because we all need to know what each of us can do specially. Starting with the Warlord, you've got two unique actions. Mm -hmm. First is Uprising. Mm -hmm. To do this, choose a hex on the board which you have influence in, but another player has control. Okay? You remove your influence token, you replace it with two ordinary units, and a combat starts straight away. That's it. That's that action. So basically you go in, get influence where somebody's got control and you can start an uprising. The next action is the mass action. When you do this, you look at every hex on the board where you have an influence token. And then for each hex, you can decide to either add one unit there, an ordinary unit from your supply, or remove the influence token and add two units. So it's a way you can get a lot of units on the board very quickly. So that's your two special actions. Off the influence. Okay with those? Yep. Right. The Murshid, you've got one unique action, which is plot, which is the thing that you're going to do before the game starts. You look at the top seven cards of the deck. You then add one of those cards to your hand that is aligned to you. So add one pinky purple card to your hand, unless you currently have no cards in hand. If you've got no cards in hand, you get two. If you look through the top seven cards and there aren't enough cards of your alignment aligned to you, then you take money for the ones you can't take instead. So if you were to draw seven cards and find none of yours, you'd get two money. Now, the cards you don't choose get shuffled and put back on top, unless there wasn't enough for you to find, in which case you put them on the bottom instead. Okay. Which therefore means that there's more chance of your cards coming out at the top. Any questions about that? No. Right, the Sultan's special action is to conspire. Look at the top 10 cards of the deck, refill any empty slots in here with cards from those 10, shuffle the rest and put them on the bottom. That's how this market refreshes. Mm -hmm. The Sultan has to take an action to do it. The Caliph has two special actions. The first one isn't exactly unique because the Nomad can do it as well, but I'm mentioning it here. It's very simple. I just take one coin. Seems slightly inefficient to spend one of my 12 turns in the game to take one coin, but there it is. That, that is an option. And the other one is I can move my palace. If I want to, I can move my palace to another area where I have presence. We just pick it up and move it. The Nomad you can collect a coin as an action, just like uh, the Caliph, but you can also perform the dessert action. To do this, you choose a hex on the board, remove any number of mercenary units from that hex owned by a single player, and for each unit removed, you put one unit, you put one thing back on there. So basically, be very, very careful if you amass mercenary units in a hex, because the, the Nomad player can just say, nah, they're all gonna disappear. Yeah. Okay? You don't gain anything from that no. as such, but it can really hurt somebody yeah, else. So it does restock your supply. It restocks the, the, the supply. Okay, any questions about the special actions? We all know what each of us can do. Right, the next thing to explain is the scoring phase. This happens after all players have taken four turns in the action phase. Each player scores points in different ways. It is all summarized in your player booklet here. You have primary objectives, secondary objectives, and a year one objective. I am going to go through them all now so that we all know what each other is trying to do. In the first year, you will score all three types of your objectives. Mm -hmm. In years two and three, 
you will only score your primary and your secondary objective. You won't score the year one objective in years two and three. So let's start with the Warlord. Now the Warlord is very special because your primary objective is not actually scored in the scoring phase. Everybody else's is, but yours isn't. Your primary objective is scored in combat. So whenever you do a combat and you sack a stronghold and or a settlement, you're going to get points. You're going to get four points if you sack a city, three points if you sack a castle, two points if you sack a town, and one point if you sack a fort. You also get one point if you sack the Caliph's palace. And that's how you're going to get a lot of points. Okay, so your secondary objectives, the Warlord's secondary objectives. If you have a castle and an influence token on the same hex, you get three points. If you control the holy site, you get four points. Uh, and if you control a contiguous group of at least four hexes, you get one point for each of those hexes. Mm. So if you control a contiguous group of three, nothing. And if you control a contiguous group of four, four points. I have a question. Yep. Um, how do I get the castle if I can't build? You capture. Okay. So although you can't build your own castles and forts, you do have some. And every time, so if you were to go here, and you would win the combat, you have two choices. So to capture or sack You either capture it or sack it. Now, okay. for you, you get points for sacking it. Mm. Capturing it means that you've now got strength in there, but you don't get the points for sacking it. And finally, your year one objective is simply to control four units on the map. If you do that at the end of year one, you get four points. We should all try to do our year one objectives. Yeah. Right, next, the Murshid. Your primary objective is for influence tokens on the map. For every influence token on the map, you get two points if there's a city there, one point if there's a town there, one point if there's no town or city but it's fertile, so here, and you get one point if the hex has your stronghold and is a quarry or a mountain. So yeah, that's one thing you're trying to do. Your secondary objectives, you get five points if you control the holy site. I think that's more than anybody else. Mm -hmm. If you don't, uh, and you also get two points if you influence it. Now, th those two things combine. So if you control it and influence it, seven points. It's huge. Um, if you have at least two strongholds on the map, you get one point for each stronghold. And your year one objective is four points if you have an influence token in a hex containing another player's settlement or stronghold, which is fairly easy to do, I think. Yeah. Any questions? No. Right, the Sultan. Your primary objective is about getting cities on the map. You're going to get one point for each city on the board. You're going to get an additional point if no other player controls the hex. You don't need to control it yourself, just as long as nobody else controls it. And you also get another point if no other player has influence in the hex. So right now, you're getting three points for that hex. One, because it's a city, nobody else controls it, and nobody else has influence there yet. Secondary objectives. If you have four, at least four influence tokens on the map, you get one point per influence token. You get four points if you control the holy site. And if you control at least three hexes, you get one point for each hex you control. And your year one objective is four points if you have at least five settlements and or strongholds on the map in total, in any combination. Okay with that? Yep. Right, the Caliph. My primary objective is to control hexes. I get one point for each hex I control. I get an extra point if there's a city there. So I really want the Sultan to build cities in hexes I control, because that's good for me. Uh, and I also get an extra point if I have a castle and an influence token on that hex. My secondary objectives are, if I control at least four hexes and more than any other player, which I think is quite hard to do, uh, then I get one point for each hex I control. So it's not just that I've got to have four, I've got to have four, and that's got to be more than anybody else. I get four points if I control the holy site. And then I get five points if I control the two quarries and the river crossing. So if I control those three places, I get five points. If I don't get those five points, then I can get two points if I control either the two quarries or one quarry in the river crossing. I think me getting those three is quite difficult. Yeah. Finally, the nomad. Now, the Nomad is interesting because the Nomad's primary objective is actually to spend money to earn points. So you've got a table in your player raid, and the more money you spend, the more points you get. It starts off as three coins for three points, mm -hmm. all the way up to 28 coins for 10 points. 
So it actually gets more expensive. Each point you buy is more expensive than the last one. The most efficient one is three for three, but you might want to do more than that. So you need lots of money in order to buy points. Your secondary objectives are having influence in at least four hexes, not controlled by another player. If you do that, you get one point for each of those hexes. Controlling the holy site is only worth two points to the nomad, which is less than the other players. And if you have presence in a contiguous group of hexes that contain two or more cities in total, you get one point per city in that group of hexes. So it's not, you can't have two cities in the same hex, but a group of hexes contiguously connected where there are two, two or more cities. And your year one objective is either to simply have two coins or be about to earn two coins in the next income phase. And that gets you four points. Any questions about the personal object? So we all know what each other's trying to do, if we can all remember that. Right, now it's time to talk about combat. So remember, this happens whenever there are pieces belonging to two different players with combat strength in the same hex, which happens because of the assault move. It can happen when you bribe mercenaries. It can happen when you uh, do your special thing. What is it? Uprising. It can happen then. So there are various ways in the game that it can happen. You put this in the hex where the combat is taking place. The combat is resolved immediately. So you have a combat reference card with the eight steps printed on there. This is very useful because everything is summarized on there. The player who performed the action that initiated the combat is the attacker. And the player who is being attacked is the defender. So first, select power cards. The attacker and the defender select any number of power cards from their hand that have the combat keyword printed on it. Now, this card here has two boxes, both that say combat. You get both of them. Okay, you get both. It isn't choose one, you get, you get both of the effects. Now, the number of cards you play is secret, but the number of cards that you have is public information. So we've come up with a method. This isn't in the rule book, but we've come up with a method of using these nice bags. So these bags are included in the game to keep your components in, but they're not needed for anything else. So what we do is you take all of the cards in your hand, hide them, and the ones that you want to play, flip them face up, and then put all of your cards in the bag. So you put all of your cards in the bag, but the ones that you want to play are face up. Okay. Once the attacker and the defender have done that, they then take the cards out of the bag, make sure they're the right way up, and the ones that are face up are the ones that are played in that combat, mm. and the rest go back to your hand. So that's step two, reveal and resolve cards. So the cards are resolved in the following order. First of all, the warfare card. So your warfare card is the first card that gets resolved. Then assassinate cards played by the attacker are the next to be resolved. Now the assassinate card is, it chooses a character card played by another player in the combat and it's discarded. So the assassinate card basically kills not just another card, it has to be another character card. So assassinate cards played by the attacker is next. Then Assassinate cards played by the defender. Mm -hmm. Then all other cards played by the attacker, fall, followed by all other cards played by the defender. Now, many of the cards instruct you to place a unit on the card. When you do that, it normally does it for some bonus, but any unit which has been placed on a card is still considered to be in the hex. Mm -hmm. It still contributes to the fight, mm -hmm. but it probably gets a bonus for being on the card. Step three is to determine the victor. Now, the way that you do that is you add up the total combat strength of all of the pieces involved. These are printed on the back page of the rulebook. And what's very useful about these player aids is that what you can see here is all of the units in the game, even ones that aren't from you. So you've all got the palace printed on the back of your sheet, even though only I can have a palace, so that you know what its combat strength is. So you simply add up the combat strength of the attacker, which is one for a unit, one for a fort, two for a castle, two for the palace. Um, and then you modify that based on the cards that are played. The highest total wins with the attacker winning ties. So if it's tied, the attacker wins. Now, step four is casualties. No matter who won the fight, both sides will suffer casualties based on half the strength of the opponent rounded down. Units on cards may be chosen as casualties. And then after suffering casualties, any remaining units still on cards go back into the hex. After suffering casualties, 
we do step five, which is the person who lost the fight, all of their units retreat. Now, retreating in this game doesn't mean moving back to another hex. It means they've gone. So ordinary units will go back to the reserve card. Mercenary units are, are gone. They just, they just run away back to the supply. So if you lose the fight, any remaining units that weren't killed go back. Speaking of killed and running away, the Warlord is going to get points for units that you kill in combat, not for ones that run away. So other than, so other than that, as the points for the Warlord, what else is the difference between killing and running away? If you kill an ordinary unit, it will go back. I believe it goes here. If, if, you, if it runs away, it goes back here. Okay. The, the, the oh, slight, yeah, the slight difference. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but not much. The Nomad is a bit special. If the Nomad loses a combat, the Nomad unit returns any units to the reserve card because they are still around and available. Step six is cleaning up the cards. So at this point, event cards will be discarded, characters and battalions will stay in front of you, and you'll get them back in the next upkeep phase. Step seven is if the attacker has at least one unit now in the hex, because it could be that you've won the fight, but you don't actually have any units left. But as long as you've got at least one unit left, if there is a fort or a castle, you may now choose to capture it. If you do, you simply take it off, swap it for one of yours. If you don't capture it, step eight is sacking. And you must sack anything that you don't capture. So if you don't capture it, you must sack it. When you sack a stronghold, you get one coin if it's a fort, two coins for a palace, three coins for a castle. And if you're the warlord, you get points. None of us get points for sacking apart from the warlord. Finally, if there is a settlement in the hex, the attacker may choose to sack that too. But that is optional. You could just leave it there. You get two coins for sacking a town, four coins for sacking a city, and the settlement goes back to the Sultan so they can build it again. Any questions about combat? Just removing the cards. Yeah. So once character and is it battalions. The battalions are played in front of you, they can't be used again until the next upkeep? Until the next round, yes. Okay, so if another fight, you, the other phase up, you ignore them until yeah. the next fight. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so that's how combat works between two players without the Murshid getting in the way, okay? <laughs> um, but the Murshid can affect the result of combat in two different ways. First of all, the Murshid has the ability to sway combat if they have an influence token in the hex where the combat is taking place. And swaying combat basically means in case of a tie, it isn't the attacker that wins, the Murshid can choose who wins. So that's the first way that the Murshid can sway the result of the combat. You have to have an influence token actually in, in the hex yeah. where it's taking place. Right. So most mobilities will work if they're adjacent. That yes. It has to be in. Yeah. So the second way that the Murshid can affect the combat is the interfere ability. This is a little bit more complex. If combat occurs in a hex or adjacent to a hex where the Murshid has influence and the Murshid is not the attacker or the defender, then they can interfere. They do that by secretly selecting cards in the same way as if they were a player involved in the combat. And then at the start of step two, before the cards are revealed, the Moshid says, I'm supporting you. They can either support the attack or they can support the defender. The cards are then considered to be played by that player for the purposes of the combat. And that's only if they've got an influence token in that hex. No, no. Or adjacent. Or adjacent. Yeah. Same as influence, same as getting involved in influence battle. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And is that negotiable? So yeah, why would the Murshid want to waste their time on getting involved in other people's fights? It's because the Murshid has the ability to make deals with other players, either the attacker or the defender or both. Mm. Now, when we first read that player aid, I, I, I didn't think it was clear that it could be both, but I have had it confirmed. It could be both the attacker and the defender. So I'll explain this now, but just to let you know, this deal ability also works in influence contests. So I'm going to explain it now for combat, but exactly the same thing applies to influence contests. So if there's a combat between two players in or adjacent to a hex where the Murshid has an influence token, the other players may offer up to five points to the Murshid in exchange for their support. Your support can include breaking ties or playing cards. If you agree to support a player, then they must give you the agreed number of points if they win, whether you help them or not. So 
Here's, I'll here's the thing. Only if you win. Only if you win. So here's right. the thing. I'm doing a fight. I'm I'm attacking Peter, right? And I say to Rob, I, I'll I'll give you one point if you support me. And Rob says, Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. And Rob does absolutely nothing to support me. If I win the fight anyway, I still give him a point. Yeah. Okay. Because if I don't win, he doesn't get the points. Yeah. Because you can't prove I didn't help. Which is no, a exactly. Secret, subtle way. My <laughs> agents were there, definitely. <laughs> um, if they lose, they don't give you any points, yeah. even if you help them. Okay. So that's that's the downside. If you decide to help, and actually we lose the fight, we've lost the fight. I don't give you any points, and you've lost whatever yeah, help you gave. My, I gain points by winning the fight. So yeah, but it could I'd be, be giving if away. you two are fighting, mm. you can both promise me three victory points for. Yeah. Yeah. And I you're going to get three points, yeah. and you'll get three I anyway. Know, I, then, then I just, I don't know, I just came back because it might be that I don't want you to win the fight because I know you get more victory points. Yeah. So I'll support other Paul. Yeah. yeah. But with the knowledge that even if it goes wrong, I still get points. You still get the money anyway. Promise exactly. to back up you. Yeah. yeah. But if I if I lie and backstab everyone, no one will, no one will trust me. So I'll save the backstabbings for the appropriate moments. <laughs> <laughs> now, although I normally don't like to give strategy advice during a teach, for my two plays of this game so far, the Murshid has won both of them, and that's because we've been giving. Too many points to the Murshid for help. We were learning the game, so we didn't really know, but we were offering two, three, four points, and it ended up that the Murshid was getting more points than you were actually gaining. So when you do make a deal with the Murshid, just be aware of how many points you're going to get from it, and obviously try not to give too many points away. Or if you're a defender, how much is it going to cost you? A to exactly, lose? exactly. Because if it will if just be cheaper to replace them through another action than to pay me... Yeah. yeah, three yeah, three actions worth of victory points. Yeah. Any questions about combat? Mm. Right. Influence contests. This is a little trickier than combat, but again, it's summarised on the reference card. So an influence contest begins whenever a player takes the influence action where another player has presence mm. or that is adjacent to where the Murshid has an influence token. So, for example, if I, as the Caliph, take the influence action here or here, or here, it's all fine. And I just I just do it and there's no contest. But if I wanted to try and take influence here, well, I couldn't because it's not adjacent. Uh, here, there'd be a contest because although Peter doesn't have influence there, he has presence there. So he'd have something to say about it. And if the warlord tried to get influence here, that would also trigger a contest because the Murshid is, is adjacent. adjacent. The player who performed the action is the attacker, and all other players with presence in the hex, or the Murshid if they're adjacent, is considered to be a participant. So it isn't an attacker and a defender, it's an attacker and everybody else is a participant. Step one is like combat selecting power cards. This is done in the same way you secretly select any number of cards that you want to play, but you are looking for the ones that say... None. Wow. Mm. These were shuffled. Oh, no, there, Influence Contest. We have some cards with Influence Contest written on. Each participant in step two declares whether they are supporters of or defenders against the attacker. This is done in player order if multiple people are involved, warlord and clockwise. Then all of the played cards are revealed and resolved. Attackers assassinate cards, supporters assassinate cards, defenders assassinate cards, attackers other cards, supporters of the cards, defenders of the cards. Step four is you calculate the attacker's influence. Now, this is a little bit tricky because the first thing you do is you check to see whether they have military influence or not. And if they do, then they get one point of military influence. And you have military influence if they have any combat strength in the hex, either from their own pieces or from any supporters. So for example, if I wanted to try and do an influence here, the Murshid's next door. So I'm the attacker, the Murshid is a participant. If we go into the contest, I have a military influence there of one. Even though I've got three combat strength, I've just got I've got military, you are you've either got military influence or you haven't. Okay? Yeah. So I have one influence so far in this influence contest. If you had two units, would that be one? Still it's, one? A, it's a maximum of one. Mm. Then you check to see if you've got civilian influence, which is if the attacker, in this case me, has a settlement in the hex. I do. So I've got one point of civilian influence as well as one point of military influence. Now, 
The wording is, if the attacker has a settlement in the hex, all of the, set, all of the towns and cities are actually the Sultan's towns and cities. Okay? So don't think, like, for example, if you get control of this hex, that is not your town. That is not your city. It's still yeah. Peter's it's city. Yeah. Okay? Um, and yeah, the Caliph's palace counts as both a settlement and a, strong, and a stronghold. So it provides both civilian influence and military influence. Third, for each supporter who has a settlement or an influence token on the hex, the attacker gets one more influence. Now, why the person who has influence in the hex would want to support the attacker, I don't know. But if they do, they get an extra one. Then you add the cards, and that's the total influence. So just as a reminder, it's a maximum of one from military, a maximum of one from civilian, and a maximum of one for each supporter. And then you add on the cards. Hmm. The defender's influence is one if they've got military influence, or one if any defend if any of any of the defenders has military influence, it's one. Either the player who well, there's no actual defender, is there? But it's basically you know everybody who's supported the defender, mm -hmm. as long as between them they've got military uh, they've got combat strength, they get one military influence. Second, if any defender has a settlement or an influence token in the hex, then that's another one, no matter how many there are. And then you add the influence from cards. Step six is determining the victor with the attacker winning ties. If the attacker wins, they put an influence token in the hex. If there was already an influence token in the hex, that is returned to the original player. If the defenders win, nothing happens. Quick note about the Caliph's Palace. Oh, I've mentioned that, yeah. It counts as military and civilian influence. Step seven is cleaning up the cards, which is the same as before. Event cards are discarded. Characters go in front of you. That's how it works without the Murshid getting involved. <laughs> so now, the Murshid, as mentioned earlier, the Murshid can use their ability to make deals in influence contests as well as combat, with other players offering up to five points for help. And also, if the contest takes place in a hex where the Murshid already has influence, you can choose that the defender wins ties instead of the attacker, which I think you would always do. Because you're the one with influence there. I suppose technically you could even offer the merchant points just to not get involved. Yeah. Yeah. The attacker. You could do. Because yeah. then if they win. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions about influence contests? Right. The last bit. After the scoring phase, it's the end of the year. Play proceeds to the next year. And then after three years, it's game over. There is no final scoring in this game. Your final scoring is the scoring phase of year three. And that's it. So we're basically going to score three times during the game. If the points are tied, it's the most coins that wins. If it's still tied, it's Warlord and Clockwise of the tied players. And that is how you play Crescent Moon. So as I mentioned, yes, it is a long video, but I did go into all of the different factions and what they can do. The next stage, if you're interested, is to check out the playthrough video. Again, click on the little eye in the corner or the link in the description. And uh, yeah, you'll see a full five player game of it. Thank you again to Osprey Games for commissioning this video. And a big thank you to all of my patron supporters who helped from the channel. As always, please give the video a like, subscribe to the channel if you aren't already. And if you have any comments about the game, please leave them in the comments below. Until next time, take care and thanks for watching.